Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I'm going to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In today's video, I'm continuing um, my analysis into semiotics and um, sort of the structure of semiology within Locke, um, uh, Saussure, and and finally in uh, Lacan. We're getting close to Lacan. Uh, I'm about to wrap up Saussure. Uh, I think the next section, if not the next section, the section after that actually begins the analysis of, of, of Lacan. So I've gone through and I've talked briefly uh, in earlier videos about Locke's role and we saw that Locke made sort of the initial link between the sound and and the idea. Then we moved into Saussure and Saussure takes that idea, uh, sort of this link that Locke introduces in I think book three of uh, Essays Concerning Human Understanding. He takes that idea between the sound and the idea, and he modifies it a bit, and he, he calls it the sound pattern and its relationship to the concept. We recognize that the sound, um, the sound pattern for Saussure so isn't strictly speaking just, though it doesn't exclude, it isn't strictly speaking just the sound, just the wavelengths, because um, you can think of, he says, you know, you can think of um, the sounds that are made in my mind if I think quietly to myself. So if I'm thinking in my mind of tree quietly to myself, and I don't vocalize it, that thought, tree, thinking that sound pattern um, is synonymous with the sound pattern. So the sound pattern can be tree or the sound pattern can be my, my thought of tree. And he relates that to the concept. We talked about the relationships, the varying relationships between um, signal, uh, signification and signal, between concept and sound pattern, between signified and signifier, and now we have a better understanding. And then in the last section what I discussed, uh, I think that was that was either yesterday or the day before. This today's day four of, of, of the shoot, the video shoot. But um, whatever day it was, I think it was, I think it was yesterday. We talked about um, organizing the um, linguistic principle, right? We wanted to know what this principle was, and we recognized that for Saussure, and actually for all linguists since Saussure, um, the real conception of of semiotics is rooted in an understanding of the function of the linguistic community. And I talked about the role of the linguistic community. In adopting, um, in adopting sort of this relationship, this very, this very inherent relationship between um, the concept and the, and the, uh, the sound pattern. What I'm going to do in today's lecture is we're going to talk about value. So um, we're going to look at a broader scope of the linguistic community. Now we're really going to get into the in sort of the, the nitty gritty of the linguistic community. Um, and not only the linguistic community, but how we come to talk about familial relations of languages, right? Why is it that the Romance languages, and I'm not going to get into details like, on that because I'm not, a, I'm not a linguist proper. I'm more interested in value. I'm not really interested in literally sort of why um, these, 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 uh, these languages are considered Romance languages or these type of languages and so on. I'm not going to get into that sort of analysis. Um, what I am going to do is, I'm, and what's of interest in this particular segment of the video, as I've done through all the videos, is that I'm very, very interested in the relationship between value, and I, I think I do discuss it in this, uh, yeah, um, I'm very, very interested in the distinction between value and meaning within um, semiology, right? What is the distinction between value and meaning? Because value and meaning for Saussure are not interchangeable. Um, so I'm going to make sure that there's a clear distinction, um, uh, both visually and conceptually, that you understand the difference between value and meaning, because it seems as though, you know, the first, the first time I was uh, introduced to the text years ago, I couldn't quite understand the distinction between value and meaning, and I wanted to make sure that, in you guys asked me to take it deep, and in, in at this level of depth, and we're pretty deep now, that there's a clear understanding of this distinction, because it'll be important, um, otherwise we're just not going to have any idea of the significance of what Lacan is contributing to uh, this overall discussion. With that being said, uh, let's begin. So this is an intro to an intro to semiotics, and this is section two. All right. Um, let's begin with uh, a quote. This quote comes from uh, Saussure himself. The quote, quote, the value of a word, the value of a word, and remember, I want to make the distinction between value and meaning, so I'm going to methodically now start to delineate one from the other. Um, quote, the value of a word is mainly or primarily represented in terms of its capacity to represent a certain idea. 
right? Emphasis on idea. Um, I'll read that again. The value of a word is mainly or primarily represented in terms of its capacity, the word's capacity, to represent a certain idea. Okay? So basically, we can say that value, value, the value of a word is mainly or primarily understood, uh, represented in terms of its capacity, its capacity, to represent a certain idea. Right? So that there is a sense in which we have an idea, right? And the value of the word is sort of how it represents the idea, right? How does this represent the idea? I was thinking of an example, real sort of, because, you know, we just started a lecture, I mean, a minute ago. Um, and I was thinking in preparation of the video, how am I going to make a distinction that's clear? Um, it's, it's, it'll be really, really generalized, and I'll complicate it later. But how can I make a distinction that's clear so that you really understand sort of this distinction that I'm going to be getting at later in the lecture? And I thought of, um, I thought of probably the greatest, I'm not going to get into it, but, um, well, I might later on a deeper level. But I thought of what I figure is probably the greatest uh, representation, probably the greatest sign in the world, <laughs> the sign of having a child. Your, your child, my, my son, is in a sense, a representation of me, right, if you really want to be sort of vain about it, right, so that I have, this is me, and here's my son, or my daughter, I mean, my daughter can represent me as well, or my children, I'll just say in general, and we can look at it, it says the value of a word is mainly or primarily represented in terms of its capacity, the word's capacity, for representing an idea. How does this word represent an idea? Similarly, how is it that um, my child is a representation of me. He's, um, you know, and it's funny, this is like in Austin Powers, and I can really go sort of on, off on the deep end, but I just started the lecture, so I don't want to get too deep too quick. But this is, uh, I thought it was very, very, very interesting when I first watched um, the Austin Powers series that they called um, the little person Mini Me, right? It, really, that is pretty, that's telling, right? What is the capacity that Mini-Me has in representing Austin Powers? Um, how effective is Mini-Me in representing Austin Powers? And how, how, how did that relationship between Mini-Me and Austin Powers communicate to the audience at large? How is it that my children are a representation of me? I mean, they're nerds like I am, and so on and so forth, right? So, just in a, in a very general sense, we see in the real world, outside of the linguistic community, um, in a very, very general sense, that we can have representations embodied within things. And just to begin, one of the ways that I, you, we as uh, species are represented is in our offspring. Our, off, uh, our offspring are represent literally, I mean biologically, and also figuratively, representations of us. So I, I just wanted to throw that in there for a little bit. I'll return to that later because it'll get more, it'll get more complicated in a bit. Um, and, and also, there's, a, there's, a, there's an obvious relationship, right? There's an obvious relationship. There's an obvious relationship between me and my kid, right? So there's a representation. There's a representation of me, of me, in mini-me, right? There's a representation of me, in mini-me, but there's an also sort of familial relationship between me and many me, right? So I'll complicate that later. Next quote from, um, where's this from? This quote is from Saussure as well. Quote, value. So now we understand value, right? Value is um, mainly or primarily represented. It itself is represented in terms of a capacity for representing an idea. The next quote is, quote, value in its conceptual aspect, right? In its conceptual aspect is doubtless part of meaning, right? Now this is where it becomes sort of a very, very fine line. Because so Sir says himself, right, that value is a part of meaning, right? He says value in its conceptual aspect is doubtless part of meaning, right? It, it's part of meaning. Now we have to figure out how is it that we make a separation between value and meaning? Because if one is part of the other, then you can see why there would be some confusion in what is actually value and what is meaning in in semiotics, at least according to Saussure. What I'm interested, as I told you from the very, very introductory video where I posed the semiological question to my community of viewers, 
personally, I'm interested in meaning. Not to say that value is important. You really can't understand one without the other, but I'm emphasizing meaning in this discussion. So what we see is that value is also is part of meaning. And by the end of this video, it'll be extremely clear the distinction between value and meaning. Right now, uh, unless you already know the distinction in semiotics, I, you, you wouldn't be able to sort of understand it from what I've said so far. What I'm doing right now is just sort of laying the conceptual framework. Okay, now, conceptions, uh, conceptions of linguistic meaning. Conceptions of conceptions of linguistic meaning. There's a primary source of meaning, and I want to talk about sort of this distinction between the primary and the secondary source of meaning in semiotics. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because um, the concept isn't actually that easy to grasp, right? So there's a primary source of meaning. and a secondary source. So let's look at the primary source. Um, the primary source of meaning is the relationship between, right, the relationship between signal and signification, or signal and signification, right? The relationship between signal and signification, and this is an instantiation of meaning, right? And I'll give you an example. So we have our signification here, and we have our signal here, right? We have our signification here, and we have our signal here. And the question is, um, how is this a relationship of meaning? How do we come to understand this as a relationship of meaning? 